Hello. This video teaches a general approach to examination of the knee. In clinical practice, however, a good history will help you to focus your physical examination. Remember that knee pain can arise from any of the bone, cartilaginous or soft tissue structures in or around the joint. You may need to examine the joint above and below, in this case the hip and ankle and foot. Knee pain can also be referred from the back and should be considered if the source of pain is not found at the knee itself. In this video, however, I would focus on knee examination only. For teaching purposes, I have structured the examination into inspection, palpation, range of movement, power assessment, and special test. When asked to examine the back or any part of the lower limbs, always take note of the patient's gait. Look at the mechanics for symmetry and smoothness of movement. Take note of the patient's ability to turn quickly and smoothly. Note the stance phase from heel strike to mid stance to toe off. With an antalgic or painful gait, the patient limps and the stance phase is shortened on the affected side. Look at the swing phase and stride length. If the pelvis drops on the swinging side, this indicates weakness of the hip abductors on the opposite side. Bilateral hip abductor weakness produces a waddling or Trendelenburg gait. If possible, inspect the patient while standing and remember to compare both sides. Look from the front for any evidence of muscle wasting or swelling around the knee. Look from the side. The patient should be able to stand with the knee fully extended at 180 degrees. Look for any hyperextension or genu recurvatum. More than 10 degrees is considered abnormal. Take note of any flexion deformity or genu procurvatum. This is always abnormal. Look from the back. Swelling within the popliteal fossa is often caused by a Baker cyst. Take note of any deformity, such as genu varum or bow leg deformity, or genu valgum or knock knee deformity. The knee should also be inspected with the patient supine. Look for skin changes such as scars, erythema or rashes such as psoriasis. Look for swelling. Normally one should be able to see the medial and lateral parapetella fossae. These would be full in moderate or large effusions or can be obscured by adipose tissue. Diffuse swelling with fullness of the parapetella fossae and extending into the suprapetellar recess or pouch is suggestive of a knee effusion. This can be seen in synovitis. Localized swelling suggests bursitis or tendon or ligament pathology. For example, in pre bursitis, there will be a focal swelling overlying the patella, whereas with medial collateral ligament injury and swelling, there may be localized swelling over the medial collateral ligament. Look as well for muscle atrophy. One may see wasting of the quadriceps muscle with chronic knee pathology and always compare both sides for symmetry. An initial step in palpation is to check the joint to see if it is warm or hot. Usually, the knee is slightly cooler than the lower leg or the thigh, so it should feel warm, a bit cooler, and then warm. A hot joint, especially if it is swollen, may indicate inflammatory or septic arthritis. Palpate the patella. You can also feel the border and undersurface of the patella by tilting first to one side and palpating with your thumb, and then to the other and palpating with your fingers. Palpate the quadriceps tendon, also known as the suprapatellar tendon, the quadriceps muscle, and the patellar ligament, also known as the infrapatellar tendon. While palpating, look at the patient for any evidence of tenderness or any expression of pain. Palpate the tibial tubercle. This is the bony prominence on the anterior aspect of the tibia. Cup your hands around the knee and feel the popliteal fossil. Check for the popliteal pulse. Also check for any swelling which may indicate a Baker cyst. The bony contours are best felt with a knee flex at 90. Palpate the medial and lateral tibial plateau. Feel the medial and lateral joint line just above. 
Track your thumb along the joint line from anterior to posterior. Observe and ask the patient for tenderness. As your thumb comes along the sides, you will feel cord-like structures. The medial collateral ligament, which extends from the medial femoral condyle to the medial tibial condyle, and the lateral collateral ligament, which extends from the lateral femoral condyle to the fibular head. This can better be appreciated with the figure of four position. You should also feel for patella crepitus. This is done by placing one hand over the patella and passively flexing and extending the knee. There are several bursae around the knee. These include the prepatellar bursa, which sits just over the patella, the superficial infrapatellar bursa, which sits between the ligament and the skin, and the deep infrapatellar bursa behind the ligament. The anserine bursa is located on the anteromedial aspect of the tibia. It is demonstrated here with these purple marks. Bursitis here is a common cause of knee pain. The bursa is located just under the conjoint tendon of the pes anserine, which is composed of the sartorius, gracilis, and semitendinosus tendons. Now, let us palpate for a knee effusion. As said before, the medial and lateral parapatellar fossae are normally seen. If these are full, it suggests a moderate to large effusion. We will first perform the fluid wave or bulge sign. This is also known as the milking test. With firm pressure, sweep your hand up the medial aspect of the knee, pushing fluid laterally and into the suprapatellar recess or pouch. Then immediately sweep your hand down the lateral aspect, pushing the fluid back. Look at the medial faucet to see if a bulge forms. Do not confuse this with movement of the patella or soft tissue. This is good for small effusions. With larger effusions, one may not be able to displace the fluid sufficiently to see a wave forming. The next test is a fluid blotment test. The essential principle is moving fluid with one hand while feeling the other. Place your thumb and fingers on either side of the patella. Place the other hand over the suprapatellar recess. Squeeze and press down. With moderate to large effusions, one would feel fluid forming under your fingers and pushing your fingers outwards. You may also try to push fluid back and forth by alternately pushing with one hand and feeling with the other. The next test is the patella tap. This is good for large effusions. Again, place one hand over the suprapatellar recess or pouch. Apply pressure. This will displace fluid under the patella. With the finger of the other hand, push the patella downwards towards the femur. One should feel the patella tapping the femur and coming back up to hit your finger. Again, this is good for large effusions. Let us move on to range of movement. This can be done by first assessing active range of movement and then doing passive range of movement if active is limited. Assess flexion by having the patient bring the heel to the buttock. This is normally about 135 degrees. Assess extension by having the patient stretch the leg out flat. This should be 180 degrees. If the leg does not fully extend, this indicates a flexion contracture and this is abnormal. You can also assess for hyperextension at the knee by stabilizing the knee and pulling up on the lower leg. More than 10 degrees is considered abnormal. You can also assess for internal and external rotation of the tibia on the femur. This is done with the leg at 90 degrees. Have the patient point the toes in. This is internal rotation and normally about 30 degrees. Point the toes out. This is external rotation of the tibia on the femur and is normally about 20 degrees. This can also be done with the patient sitting and hanging the leg off the bed. Patella movement can be assessed by pushing medially and laterally on the patella. Pain or apprehension when pushing laterally may indicate a prior dislocation. You can also do the patella compression test at this time if you suspect that pain is coming from the patella femoral compartment. This is done by applying pressure and pushing the patella distally. Ask the patient to tighten the quadriceps. 
Rough or painful movement may suggest patellofemoral osteoarthritis or patellofemoral syndrome. However, this test is neither sensitive or specific. Let us look at power assessment. This is best done by resisted isometric testing. Get the patient to meet your resistance rather than you trying to meet theirs. We will first assess flexion. This is done by stabilizing the knee with one hand and pulling the leg out with the other. Don't let me pull your leg out. As you would notice, this is done with the knee at 90 degrees. We will then assess extension. Don't let me push your leg in. Rotation of the tibia on the femur is not usually assessed. We would now look at special tests. The anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments are tested by the anterior and posterior draw test respectively. Remember that both ligaments originate in the intercondylar notch of the femur. The ACL is so named because it attaches on the anterior aspect of the tibia. This prevents forward movement of the tibia on the femur. The PCL, highlighted here in green, attaches on the posterior aspect of the tibia. This prevents backward movement of the tibia on the femur. Compare both tibia. Sagging of one tibia behind the level of the other may indicate a PCL tear. To perform the anterior draw test, the hip is flexed at 45 and the knee at 90. Stabilize the lower leg with your forearm. Grasp the tibia with your thumbs over the tibial plateau. Then pull forward. Laxity here suggests an ACL tear. With your hands in the same position, you can perform the posterior draw test by pushing backwards. Laxity here would indicate a PCL tear. Both of these tests would be done together. One can also perform the Lachman test for an ACL tear. In this test, the knee is held at 30 degrees. With one hand, grasp the femur, and with the other, pull the tibia forward. Laxity here would suggest an ACL tear. This test is more sensitive and has the greatest likelihood ratio for an ACL tear. For stability testing of the medial collateral ligament and lateral collateral ligament, the knee is supported and flexed at 30 degrees, with your fingers over the joint line and ideally over the ligament being tested. Test the MCL by applying a valgus truss. I am pushing in on Kim's knee and pulling out on her lower leg. Look for laxity and the patient's pain response. Conversely, test the LCL by applying a virus force. I am pulling out on Kim's knee and pushing in on her lower leg. Again, look for laxity and the patient's pain response. We will now assess for meniscal tears. You may encounter several variations of the McMurray's test. The essential principle is trying to squeeze and trap the meniscus between the femur and tibia on the side being tested while extending the knee. Let's test the medial meniscus. Place your fingers over the medial joint line to feel for a click or pop during the test. Then flex the knee maximally and externally rotate the leg. Think of this as bringing the tibia forward against the femur. Apply a virus force by keeping the knee out while pushing the lower leg in. Then extend the leg. Feeling a clunk or pop or the patient expressing pain is a positive test. Similarly, test the lateral meniscus. Place your thumb over the lateral joint line. Then flex the knee maximally. Internally rotate the leg. Think of this as bringing the tibia forward against the femur. Apply a valgus force by keeping the knee in while pulling the lower leg out and then extend the leg again. Feeling a pop or the patient experiencing pain is a positive test. Both arms of this test can be done together to create a smooth movement. The menisci can also be tested by the Apley's compression or grinding test. This is the most specific test for meniscal injury. With the patient lying prone and the knee flex at 90, apply downward pressure on the tibia and internally and externally rotate the tibia. You can apply a slight valgus force for testing the lateral meniscus and a slight varus force for testing the medial meniscus. 
Again, pain and popping or clicking is a positive test. Thanks for watching. I truly hope this was useful to you. Please be sure to subscribe. There are lots of other videos including other physical exams and injection techniques. Thanks and bye for now.